But I did have another tattoo uh, that was on my body, but I had it removed by laser that was had a young gentleman's name on it. Yeah, I've had that. I've done that, Kitty. Never done that. Never got met someone and two weeks later had their name tattooed on your body. Oh, you haven't? Oh, I thought everyone did that. No. Were you, were you intoxicated at the time? In a way, because I, when I, I write about this in the book, I, I call him Adonis. And I was, I feel, I, it's just this man I had a short lived relationship with. I feel like I was the victim of a chemical attack. Do you know, like that sort of chemistry that you have with someone and the sort of, you know, the, the endorphins or whatever is released and, and you you find yourself doing things, you're completely out of control with desire or lust or whatever it is. And, and after two weeks of knowing each other we decided we'd get our names tattooed on each other's groins and I thought that was the most sensible thing I'd ever done I really did I thought it was completely sensible and then four months after that we split up and I was left with the with the with the name Raven on my on my groin and I got what's hilarious is I got I got it um, I, went, I was in LA making a film and there was a there was a special uh, you know tattoo removal place at uh, Cedar sinai hospital so I went and you have to go several times. It's really sore. They laser it off and you can hear this. And it's the, it's the sound of the, uh, the ink exploding in your body. Is it more painful getting it removed than to actually get a tattoo? Yeah, because then also you keep, you've got to keep going back. You know, it's not just once you do it, it's several times. And it is more painful. And then also because it goes all scabby and yucky. And that's mm. sore as well. And so, but the thing was, when I went, when I eventually saw him afterwards, so about a year afterwards, I, he said, do you still have your tattoo? I said, no, I had mine wrenched from my body by laser. And he said, I said, do you still have yours? He said, kind of. And he, he pulled down his pants and where it used to say Alan, it now says balance. That's very clever. <laughs> yes, isn't that good? <laughs> I was going to say, what could you have done with his name? Ravenous, Craven. I could have taken a wee bit of the N off and been raver. I was a lot, all my friends were delighted in telling me the things that I could do. And, you know, it was ugh, yes, done, done. Oh, my friend David wanted to put done Raven. That's what he was like D U N at the beginning of it. I was like, all right, I I feel foolish enough. You don't need to do rub it in. But instead, you got it removed. Well, yeah. let's let's talk about your memoir because it's so exciting, and I know you're tired of talking about it, but. I don't know. Let's give it Not let's you, give it the Katie old Kulik. college try. Um <laughs> so it's called baggage. And I feel like Alan, you've spent a lot of time in your adult life unloading yours because this is your second memoir, of course. Yes. And and the first was really powerful about your dysfunctional relationship with your father, uh, yes. who was who was terrible. And I, I thought it was incredible that it had such an impact. And you heard from so many people who were able to to deal with or or metabolize their own dysfunctional relationships yes. with, the, with the parent. Yes. So so that was really the the focal point of your first memoir, and and you wanted to do another one because, well, mostly because well a couple of reasons of course, but mostly because I I as a reaction to the reaction to my first one, because I think the first one. It was, you know, I had this very violent and abusive father and I felt the way that it was, I mean, look, I, I, I was so excited ultimately by the way that it, it helped so many people and people keep writing me saying, I've been able to talk to my abuser, or I've talked, you know, all that stuff you just mentioned. But also there was a rhetoric which sort of said, Alan has triumphed, Alan has overcome, Alan has, con you know, Alan has conquered this terrible dark past. And I feel like that's a very American thing to sort of try and tie up things and make it all like it's done now, we're done this. Instead of just thinking, I have, you know, I am happy and I have a life that I, but I've not overcome it. It's still a part of me. It's always going to be a part of me. I think we're all like that. Oh, we all have baggage or trauma or shit in our lives. And we don't, the moment you ignore it and say, oh, I don't, and deny it, then it's just going to fester and come back to bite you in the bum. And actually it's, you just have to be open about it and honest and, you know, like in, in the pandemic, I think it's been really interesting how we've all understood the value of discussing our mental health and checking in on each other's mental health. It's, it's something we don't we haven't done as a culture before. And so actually, I think that's all that I'm asking people to do is to not think of me as something 
someone who has absolutely triumphed over something and killed it. I'm actually living with something and I've managed it. I've managed to make my life. And I think I just want to normalize the trauma and that and damage that we've all got. We all carry it and not to let's just not pretend that we can get over something. It just you just get better at dealing with it. How how do you think? I mean, obviously there's a multitude of ways, but when you think about how your abusive father, how, how that relationship and how it shaped you, you know, the older I get, the more I realize how, you know, we're just like these blobs of Play-Doh and, <laughs> and, and, and these forces that shape us and create mm. us and turn mm. us into whatever we ultimately become. Um, like I, I, being a, it just makes me realize what a huge responsibility being a parent is and, and what an, overwhelming responsibility is but i'm just curious how it's manifested itself how it continues to manifest itself and the demons that you have to continue to fight well i i get very triggered by angry men i i used to try and fix people who are angry i used to have a obsession with trying to fix i had several relationships where i was just basically trying to fix angry people I thought it was my fault. I thought there must be something I've done. I thought there was something I could do to stop them being angry. I was seeking the familiar. And I think that, that I've got I've got over that, thank goodness. But I do get very triggered by by angry, angry men. And I just, it, you know, it's something I just got to be vigilant about. Some people, you know, people have a right to be angry and maybe a bit sort of out of control, irrational anger, I find difficult. And people, I find it when people are sort of trying to bring me down, uh, I feel quite confident about myself. But when, when I'm aware that people are sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know this, if, if when you're well known and sort of seen as being accomplished, sometimes you go into scenarios and environments where people want to bring you down a peg or two. And it's sort of just their way of making themselves feel better about themselves and I find that that's very triggering for me because I want to allow them to do that and I but also I know it's not fair and I want to so I, I have to I, I really try hard to let people do their shit but not me not be affected by it not to make me sort of bring them down with me so that things like that and then also you know another thing that I feel uh, talk about a bit is, is the fact that I've never had children I I feel that I uh I did have a spell when I you know I start the book by talking about trying to have a child with my ex-wife and how in a way how grateful I am that that wasn't possible uh or didn't happen um because we split up and everything and that and me 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 um thinking about being a father is what precipitated me remembering a whole lot of stuff from my childhood that I had repressed and then having a nervous breakdown and so now I did try I, I did think about having kids with a couple of people other partners and you know and, and some people you know wanted my sperm and all that stuff uh, I was going to do that with an ex and all that stuff but now I, I'm 56 I'm not going to have kids and I I don't I don't want to but in the writing of this book and thinking about it and talking about myself endlessly <laughs> I sort of think well, I write this thing, I say, you know, I I have lots of young friends, people who are, could be my children. And I have friends of all ages, but I, I, I actually love having young friends. I think it's really great to sort of find, you know, to keep in touch with what's happening. And like my assistant's 26. I think it's great to sort of think, what's your life like now? And, you know, and the, and it is like having, you know, obviously it's a big grown up, but I am old enough to be his dad and stuff like that. And I, but, and so in a way I have become the father I wish I'd had, but it's no accident that he is uh, childless. Are you sorry, Alan, that uh, with I don't have kids. That, yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm not sorry. I really love my life. I don't want, oh God, the idea of having a kid now would be a nightmare. No, but that you didn't but ever. I think I'm, I'm, I wonder if part of the reason, or not part of, I wonder if the reason I'm, I, I wonder if the reason I didn't was that I was scared I would become my father. And so, you know, that's how far his reach uh, still still comes. And I, 
I don't like that. I don't like the fact that I have avoided something in my life that I, mean, I didn't avoid. It. I tried to. It just didn't happen. Um, but I ultimately stayed away from it because I, I, I have. It's triggering for me and it's weird. And and you know, if if when I was twenty eight and I was trying to get pregnant with my wife, that's what precipitated me having a a, a, a huge my mind completely brought all these images back and you know it did that for a reason it did that to because i had never been able to deal with them before i not i wasn't it was, i was too little and too young to process what was happening to me so it waited until i was going to go into that same sort of arena again father uh, the patriarchy i suppose and i feel that if my mind is as powerful to do that and then to, you know, make me have all those images and all those feelings and then to kind of break down, then I think it is as equally as powerful to perhaps make, persuade me not to do something just in case I wasn't fully, you know, it's that transference of, of um, the intergenerational transference of trauma is, is, a, is a thing, you know, it's a powerful thing. You can, your DNA can be changed. It's been tested your dna can be changed by the trauma that your parents have endured i think so, people are just starting to understand that too yeah, alan don't you yeah, this whole I idea do. of passing down trauma and something that is really physiological and psychically Absolutely. Uh, inherited and 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 i you know do you do you feel like and then i want to talk about this new memoir but do you feel having written about your dad in the first one that you understand, maybe you don't forgive him, but that you understand what were the forces that shaped him to be the the monster he sounds like he was? I mean, I, I sort of, I think actually I do forgive him and I'm not sure I do understand all this for, I mean, I, there's some, I'm not, I'm not sure and I'll never be sure, I'll never be able to be sure. I think he had many personality disorders. I, I think he was mentally ill, absolutely. I think he was abused by his father, yes, and he didn't break that cycle. And of course, that's also what terrifies me or terrified me that I would not be able to stop that too. I mean, I feel I've pretty much done everything you should do or can do to break a cycle by like talking about it, doing therapy, da da da. Uh, but who knows? Um, but in terms of the actual other stuff, the kind of, you know, I've talked to doctors and therapists, and I think I have got a handle on some of the sort of, as I say, personality disorders that he had, but who knows? I don't, I don't know. It's, he wasn't an evil person. He was just a very damaged and, 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 and scared person. And actually, you know, as much as he was this big macho guy and he kind of, he was very charismatic and very sexy and all that stuff as well. But he was very, I think he was scared and I think he was a coward. And I think that's, I'm not a coward. And I feel I've really, I stood up to him and I, I, you know, did things that he would never do uh, in terms of facing demons and facing stuff. So I, I, I did like in the, I was just talking earlier actually that, you know, when you read the audio book of your book, it's kind of yes. funny because you sometimes are reading aloud things you've only ever written down. And right. like the acknowledgements bit, so I, I, you don't really, you just do that at the end and you don't sort of. And in the acknowledgements to to my last memoir, not my father's son, I said in the acknowledgements that I forgave my father, but I didn't ever read that aloud until I was in the studio recording the audiobook, and I just lost it, you know, completely was weeping. So I do forgive him because I think I don't want to carry around this shit, you know. I I forgave him for me, you know. I forgive you. You did it. It happened. Let, let, I'm moving on. I'm not going to. I feel like not forgiving means you're keeping the trauma with you. So I, I don't see it as, uh, I feel it's, it's mine to give away forgiveness. So I did. Talk about how this, this memoir, because it, it is a really interesting mix. You have hilarious anecdotes yes. about everyone from Faye Dunaway, Liza Minnelli, Gore Vidal, and yet it also interweaves sort of more serious topics. How did you, how did you approach this memoir when you thought, I'm going to write a second memoir and this, this is my goal. This is what I want to do. Well, 
It took me a long time because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do actually when I started it. I thought it was maybe going to be about me coming to America and having this new life at age 30, you know, because I didn't been to America at all until I was 30. And so I had a whole other perspective. Um, but I think I sort of, over the years <laughs> that it took, I, I, you know, I think it takes you a while, unless you're writing a story and the story has an ending and you know what, and you plot it out, you know, in a fiction. My story's not ended. And so I wanted, I had to find out where, what the plot was, what the, and I've done it, you know, between two marriages, between my end of my first marriage and the beginning of my second. And I wanted to sort of say, I mean, basically I want to say that thing about, don't think I'm all finished and complete and conquered. Here's me being a bit of a hot mess a lot of the time in my life, having a great time, having a laugh, having, you know, doing all that, but concurrently with all that, also suffering and being a bit of making some bad decisions. And I think that's what I want to do. I want to kind of normalize uh, being a hot mess. You know, I think, <laughs> I think it's entirely possible to have a great successful life and also be, have moments when you're just a hot mess. So that's my ambition is to normalize hot messness. And I know that you didn't really talk at all about your your sexuality. And I know, you know, and, and that was quite intentional, it seems to me. Even you have reached queer icon status. Um, <laughs> you Well, you don't, don't really talk about dealing with. I, I should rephrase no. that. You don't talk yeah, no. about dealing with coming out or, or you know, I no. know that you, you talk about uh, the fluidity of partnerships. You talk about flings with men and women. And I know that that you feel that that whole conversation really needs to be reframed in the culture. I think I, I really do. I mean, I didn't, I left all that out on purpose. I even felt in my last memoir, you know, they wanted me to do a sort of a, when did you know all that sort of stuff? And I said, um, and also about, you know, a bit, a, a thing about Grant, my husband and stuff like that. And I said, you wouldn't ask me to do this if I was straight. You wouldn't say, when did I know I was straight? You know, nobody asks, gets asked that. <laughs> and you don't, you wouldn't ask someone who's writing a memoir to talk about, the, about, about your partner in the way that I'm, you're wanting me to do that. And it didn't feel organic or authentic to me. So I said, no. And I, and, and I feel like with this, I talk about, yes, I'm with a, a woman and now I'm with a man, but that, cause that's just how it was. And then I was back with a woman and I was with, you know, it, I just talk about my life as it was. I don't, I just feel I'm so bored. I mean, I, I said this the other day, like straight people don't know how lucky they are not to be constantly probed about their sexuality. And you, you never, you don't ever get asked about, you know, do you find it a problem being straight? Or do you know, do you, um, uh, and when did you know you were straight? And, you know, has your straightness, a fit, uh, you know, do you think being straight in Hollywood is to, all that? <laughs> that would be so funny. Um, <laughs> that would and, be a good uh, SNL skit. It would, wouldn't it? Yes. And I, 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 so that to me is really boring. And also I think, you know, what I think is really interesting about the time we live in right now, this sort of time of non binariness and fluidity, and the, I, and the notion that I think is coming into our culture much more of that you, you, you don't have to be one or the other. You can go, you can go back and forward between gender and sexuality and everything. That's kind of something I've always sort of felt. I've always felt that I was, I would always define myself as bisexual. If people call me gay, I don't mind. Queer, I totally, I like queer actually. I think it's a good thing because it's sort of, it's an umbrella that's not just about sex, you know, it's much more sort of about uh, sensibility as well. But also I think I, I, uh, I think that I have this thing I say, it's kind of a joke, but I think it's true is that, you know, sexuality to me is like, it's gray, it's not black and white. It's sexuality is like, like a vacation. You don't always want to go to the same place twice. And I think that's something that people are more able to understand now. And I don't, you know, what am I supposed to say? Like, oh, well, at school, I, you know, I had sex with this boy and then I had sex with this girl. I mean, I don't, that's not what my book's about. It's not what I want to talk about. Uh, I don't feel that that's what, that's what, uh, you know, um, I feel I have talked so much about my sexuality and been so open about it. That's my, what I have to say. That's what I have to, I, I, I'm open and I, do, I have no shame about sexuality. I think that's the biggest thing I can give to society. I just, I'm not interested in, you know, uh, when did you know? And 
I, what effect it has, all that I, stuff. I do think it's so interesting, Alan, how how you can look back on the last 40 years. You know, when I wrote my book, um, yeah, I was talking about sort of some of the cluelessness I had early on in my career. I remember interviewing Matthew Shepard's parents, Judy and mm. Dennis, who I yeah. became very friendly with. They're darlings, aren't they? And they're so nice. And I know they've honored you at, yes. uh, at their foundation. And, you know, I remember I write in my book about asking the Shepherds if they were disappointed when Matthew told them they were gay, it, he was gay. And are, were they disappointed that they weren't, you know, possibly going to have any grandchildren? Or I think Dennis volunteered that. Mm -hmm. it sounds so dated now. It does, and, doesn't it? And but, just yeah, so, so um, so, so just like, what? <laughs> I suppose and, that's and, the thing that we've grown, we've changed, our culture has changed about sort of, I mean, it's actually, although it's so precarious and I feel so scared about America actually and about how there's so much awful stuff bubbling under the surface, you know, that we saw during the time of Trump and could easily come back again and could be more, you know, I don't take my rights and my life in this country for granted. I think I could easily be persecuted uh, if things went slightly the other way. But I think with so much actually has changed. And since, you know, and, 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 and then, of course, Matthew Shepard was a huge turning point, I think. And that was actually right when I first came to New York, 1998. That's when I was doing cabaret. I remember it. And um, but I think those things, those it's like it's like, you know, stuff pre me too stuff. Right. It sounds now so like how insane could we have put up with all that? But actually what you're talking about when you said that to him, that is very much how people thought in those days. It, it's it does it is dated, but it's it's not it's not offensive. Or it wasn't offensive or meant from any place of offence. It's just really interesting how things in certain areas sometimes change so fast. It's emblematic, I think, uh, uh, when when you look back, you know, I'm eight years older than you are and you know, when I was growing up we sort of vaguely probably knew a gym teacher was gay or somebody was gay. My French teacher, Mr. Holt, who I loved was gay. I suspected, but it was just so not spoken about or no. maybe a wink, wink here and there. And then I fast forward it to 2015 when I interviewed Jim Obergefell, who was the plaintiff in the same sex marriage case in the Supreme yeah. Court. And, you know, that was only six years ago. And that almost feels like a lifetime ago. So to me, I think all these issues that you talk about are the things that I wanted to talk about and the the really seismic sh shift we've seen in the culture. It is. You know, yes, it's precarious, I agree. But thank God, right? Yeah, oh my God, Thank yes. God that's, totally. that, that, that we're having these these reckonings. And thank God that we have got a generation of young people who are coming up who don't think in the same way that we are, who weren't brought up in the same way that we are, who have grown up with the possibility of otherness all around them. An example, because of the internet, like they see so many different things. They have people in their classes who are transitioning or have two dads or two mom. You know, it's just, we live in a world that has changed so much. And for young people, actually the interesting thing about you know, people at Matt's age is that they've always grown up with the internet. And I think that's completely changed people. If you've never not known the internet, not known that you have access to anything in the world, at a couple of clicks, that is a, that completely changes, must change hugely how you see the world. I mean, also, it's, I think it certainly gives you different concentration skills, but it also uh, yes. <laughs> puts you in a way that in the, into a thing of, You've had so many options. You've had so much. Obviously, there's room for misinformation there, but I just I am so kind of heartened by by the young right now. I, I, I really agree. Am. And I agree with you. It's a double edged sword because for every thing it's exposed and normalized, it's also created a, a platform for right. the kinds of things we don't want. But, you know, I was thinking as we talk about the arc of history, cabaret was a huge moment not yes. only for you personally, you know, you won the whole Broadway production, won a slew of awards. People were obsessed with the show and with you. And you have an interesting analysis about why 
and why that show was so embraced, which I think is a little bit about what we're talking about. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's because, I, you know, in writing this book, I oh, that time for me was so incredible. Coming to New York, my first job in New York, I'm starring in a bloody musical. It becomes a sensation. I win all these awards. I'm just fetid everywhere. I was overwhelmed by this, this wave of love. The city kind of opens its arms to me. I have no kind of touchstone. I have nothing to compare it to. It's it's very difficult. And it was a lot happening. And I suddenly, I was 33, and I was suddenly becoming a sort of, you know, obje sexually objectified in a way that I'd never been before. Um, my body was discussed in a way that was fascinating to me, but also really weird. I just had no, and it was out of nowhere. <laughs> but what I, you know, when I was writing this book, and also because I'm actually re very close friends with Monica Lewinsky, and I, because when I first came to, when I, was, I remember being in rehearsals for Cabaret in my little flat in the West Village, and turning on, you know, turning on the TV and it, all these rumblings about something big happening in Washington, and that the the president was having an affair, and I remember just thinking, what's what the hell's wrong with these people? That why was this such big news and what's going on and you know, so over that time when I was doing cabaret and becoming this sort of saucy, sexy, sensational thing, uh, the 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 kind of real life of America was about looking at this um, sort of uh, forbidden relationship to an older man and younger woman and getting gratuitous details of their sex and being sh putting shame and scorn on it. And, you know, like, we all know that Monica had this, the first person in the world to be sort of shamed by the internet on a global scale. And I just think it's really interesting that in that year, she had all that, a woman, a young woman, was so ashamed about her sexuality. And I, and me, in this role being like a, you know, almost like a sexual deviant was what, how I was described, being absolutely lauded and, and, uh, praised and just everyone thought I was just great and I think in a funny sort of way it's because people were we were escapism we were it was all this shame and stuff heaped onto sexuality and people having to sort of tell their kids what a blowjob was and all this stuff people being furious about that and then actually here in another way is oh look we can just we can pretend it's all not happening and look at this young skinny European boy plastered across buses and uh, being all naughty I, I, I do think there was a connection, but that's why, in a way, the production was so successful at that time. You, I'm fascinated by your friendship with Monica. You know, I know her dad, Bernie, oh, uh, who's a radiologist. Yeah, because during that whole thing, uh, we needed to get to know some of the people who were involved in that story. I wasn't, mm. I wasn't super enmeshed in it because this was right around the time my husband died, and I was sort of. Uh kind of just holding on for dear life. But but it's so interesting to me, so important and still so challenging for people to reconceive, if that even is a word, what Monica Lewinsky was and, and how she was treated in the culture. And I was just reading an article in Slate about how Maureen Dowd, who you know I'm oh. friendly with, but she how she vile to her vile yeah. vile and brutal and Whole we're having was, yeah. yeah and we're we're really i think coming to terms or you know many people are coming to terms with how she was vilified and portrayed and you know how feminists turn their backs on her yes and yes. um and i'm curious i would love to know if you feel like it's not um betraying any confidence i uh, sort of how you got to know Monica and what you've what you've learned from her and 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 what your impressions are because I know you're very good friends. Are very good friends. Yeah, I love her. We met at a party in 2000. Uh, I'd written an article for Marie Claire magazine, and uh, Glenda Bailey was the editor then, and and she um, and had a party for me, and 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 she invited Monica because Monica had had done something about Monica in the previous issue or something. So that's how we met. And we went to this dinner afterwards. And I have, I have a picture of, of that night, actually, of the of us meeting, you know, because there was paparazzi there. 
And then we went to dinner and it was just incredible. There was people leaning over the banquette trying to touch Monica's hair. And it was it was just incredible. And I was just sitting, getting to know this really lovely girl. I incredible, incredible, like weird, super weird. Super weird stuff going on. Like leaving the restaurant. And I spoke to her recently about this. And she, and she said, I, I just don't remember that. And she goes, I blocked out so much, you know, and I understand that from being, you know, having had repressed memories with my dad. I, leaving the restaurant with her, it was like a mob scene. And I was just, I immediately felt so protective of her. And I, yeah, I really feel it came from, I just, I just, we got, we hit it off. We had a really, we had nice chats. And then I just, I helped her get home. And I just was like, wow, she's got, and then I read, uh, then I read the book, um, the book that, um, what's his name wrote, the man who wrote the Diana book as well, you know that one. Um, Andrew Morton. Yes, I read that book and I was just, I, you know, I'd obviously known what, what the sort of headlines were and watched things on television, but hearing it from her point of view, I was like, what the hell? And so then, then we just stayed friends and I went, you know, it went through various stages of when she, the first couple of years we were friends, she kind of would come out to things and then she kind of hid, hid away. Then she went to London and did her uh, course in psychology. And then she, then she, then she kind of hid and kept her head down and tried to figure out what to do with her life. And she knew that, you know, it was, she was on a hiding to nothing, whatever she did, it was always going to come back to that. And, oh, she should, she, you know, if she tried to do anything with her life, then it was like, oh, she was using all that as a stepping stone. And it was just a mess. And then she, I think she just waited and got better, you know, so she was going through a lot of stuff herself. She was trying to deal with the fact that she had been shamed and abused. Violated. And violated in this incredible, unlike anyone else in history, actually. And so that's why when I think about her, I think she is a remarkable person to have gone through everything she's gone through and to come out of it so kind and well-balanced it's a miracle, you know, she is, it shows what an incredible person and the sort of strength of her character and her upbringing and her values. Cause she, uh, you know, I, it's, it's inconceivable I, to, to think what, it just, it's in, you know, some of the things I've experienced with her early on, the way people reacted to her. And so for that to be your life every single day and then to be so wronged in such a public way and also to see the person who betrayed you, denied you. I mean, I guess it was Linda Tripp who ultimately betrayed her, but for the president to say on television that she was lying, to see him kind of be, uh, you know, for his reputation to be restored and to be like, oh, what a great guy. That, very, quick, I think, very quickly, really. Very quickly. To have that all happen, I think that must have been a, such a, you know, a total mind fuck. And that, that must be, I, I, I and also to have been in love, but to have been in love. You're young, you're in your early twenties, you're in love and you get abs you get that happens to you. How, what does that do to how you think about relationships and your possibility of that? You know, I mean, it's just, so to have for her to have been so eloquent and elegant in the way that she's come back and talked about it, given her blessing to this TV show, talk about to use her platform for other people who are internet shamed and and you know bullied online and everything it's just I, I just I think she's an incredible person and and also you know also hilarious one of the funniest people I know and just and kind and love and she's you know my she was at my wedding she knows my mum you know my family all love her she my mum had this friend called Jack who was a sort of partner and he he died sadly but he he once said and Monica loves this I, I, I said he said you know you should tell uh, of all the famous people I've met with you, Alan, not Tina Turner. It's Monica, who's my favourite one. Like that. <laughs> I love Tina Turner gets pushed to the <laughs> curb. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I, I would, I, I, you know, you cannot only imagine the trauma that she went through. And I just, I really, I think she, I, I don't know her that well. I know her a little bit. And I Did you know interview her ever? I didn't, you know, we were going to interview her for the podcast and I, if I'm not allowed to say this, they'll cut it out. So 
we were going to interview her for the podcast. And I think she saw me getting so much, uh, you know, hate online that it was very triggering for her. Oh, uh, well, and, just recently, you mean about your, yeah, about your book, about my book. And I think she, right. you know, it's yeah, yeah. still, it's still really hard for her. And I, it I, is. Well, I respect also, that. And totally. I, and she probably feels that way about you when, you know, when people she knows gets, you know, yeah. unfairly targeted or yeah. people who just do want to, to, to bring you down or yeah for whatever, whatever reason they no, have. She's very, very supportive. She really gets that. And also I think, you know, this TV show that's on right now, the, 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 um, impeachment and it's very interesting because it tells it from the point of view of the women it's mostly about you know obviously monica's a big huge character in it but it's mostly about linda tripp uh and about it's, i i think what's really interesting you see how all these women are manipulated into behaving the way they did and tricked and you know and it's so sad and just last week i it was the episode when she's you know in the room with the fbi when the sting thing happens and just the way that she was treated in that room let alone what happened to in just the rest of the world just unbelievable isn't it just can you that, imagine just the lie she was told the way they tricked her the disrespect 20, and, she, and turned, she was 21 you know 21, right yeah 22 i think when 22 and, and and she at the end of it you know she she turned around and went thank you very much to them and when i i mean and i asked her that the bit when she went into the shopping center she went to call her mom and the fbi were telling her and she came back out and she saw linda trip linda trip had gone shopping and that was actually true. She did run into it in the in the mall, and I think that. So I think right now it's a very triggering time for Monica. She, of course, it's yes, of course, reliving the most traumatic time of her life and having the rest of the world see it, and it's being worrying. The last time they saw it, they judged her in a very different way. It's a very, it's a, you know, she's. I think she's having a tough time right now, uh, just because of all that. But I keep saying to her. You must understand that it's it is such a positive thing for you. The way that we everyone is so sort of both ashamed at how they bought into the whole thing 20 years ago and also so proud of you for coming back and dealing with that and head, doing it face on and making sure that other people benefit from the retelling of what happened to you. She, she, I mean, it's, it's amazing. She's, you know, she's in the process of reclaiming her narrative, but she's yeah. still, I, I, I still it's think she's she's coming out the other side yeah, right she is. and that's an she uncomfortable is, but, place but it's a difficult it's so difficult how are you doing then about your internet hate was it awful um it, you know i don't really i try to not pay too much attention to it yeah you know? me too. um i tried to write a very honest book about my my own shortcomings and some of my own uh blind spots and um, and is it because excerpts of it were leaked? How did yeah, people? Yeah, and then sort of plucked and distorted and twisted. And, um, you know, I think that's sort of the culture we live in. Uh, mm. It's, it's you know, when my somebody at a publishing house said good reviews don't sell books. <laughs> right. I thought that I thought that sort of sold it, uh, told it all. Right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and uh, we live in a culture that is sort of gossipy prurient sells books too. Yeah, that's it, that's and it, yeah. and just just um, you know, it's 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 pretty vicious. So I've tried to insulate myself from it because yeah. um, it's it's just not as I said the other day. It just does not reflect the spirit, tone, or content of my book. Um, but how did it get leaked? I have no idea. That must be so annoying. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's disappointing because you want, you know, you write a book to give people context and the whole picture mm -hmm. and not just things here or there mm -hmm. that, you know, they're cheeky places there. I would say it's, there's some wry observations, Alan. <laughs> I'm sure there are. <laughs> and, uh, and some of them have just been completely distorted. Um, and, and uh, you know, another narrative have has been sort of concocted. So I just, you know, I'm really proud of the book. Everyone I know of people who know and care about me and some who just know and don't care about me that much 
have really liked and appreciated it. So, right. you know, I think you have to take solace that that you wrote something that was true to you. Totally. And and reflects who you are. But it's so interesting, I think, that in, you know, a time when we've got that show on Apple about, you know, the morning show that is dealing with some of the real life things that happened in, in, in a morning show and stuff that you must have been around and victim or or around, just around. Yeah, some, yes some and no, toxic... yes and no. You know, I, well, I, I, I was gone in 2006. Oh. So, um, you know, I think some of it is much more modern, but yes, yes, that but the, kind of But culture. the sort of toxicity of that and the patriarchal... Yes, definitely. Supremacy definitely. and all that stuff. And yet here you are, a woman speaking out about your life in that area and you're being having a lot of shit thrown at you before people actually really read the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It's nothing, you know, it's not exactly balanced and it doesn't look like much has changed. And I don't know, I think, think that's that, you know, the whole thing of, oh, if someone is a, of a man's really difficult and uh, an actor, you know, on set. I mean, they're like, oh, but they're really a perfectionist and they really just, you know, and if it's a woman. Demanding like, oh, and ha have high standards, that's right? right? have high standards. And if it's a woman, she's just a bitch and what a pain in the ass, you know, and that's, yeah. that's, that, that's true in all areas of, of society, I think. And, and it's so ingrained in us that. Isn't it you, so shocking you, though, yeah. that that, you know, I remember interviewing, um, Barbara Streisand, or at least reading, I don't even know if I interviewed her about this, but reading when she was directing Yentl or when she was working on, uh, what is it, The Mirror? The Mirror has two faces. Yes, has two faces. I think that was with Jeff Bridges, I believe. Yeah, um, I think so. And, and, and she was portrayed so unfairly. And, you know, even hearing the stories, you're like, oh, well, I'm sure she's difficult, but I'm sure <laughs> she was directing yeah. she was Just in like, charge yeah, yeah. She, was, she was saying this is what i want this is what i need but there's some kind of it, there's an inability for people to square yeah uh femininity and power still and yeah. yet it's 2021 and i think it's fascinating i always feel like we're much further along than we actually are and then i'm always like oh yeah right this really yeah. hasn't changed and i think you know I, I, I think what happened, you know, what, what COVID suddenly took over the narrative. You know, it's like it was like almost like me too should get COVID's PR person because it <laughs> uh, it kind of lost the narrative a little bit. And I feel like we were starting to deal with everything and starting to re calibrate where we were. And then and then also in the thing of just in life in general about consent and talking about well what how do we do consent how do we do we're in a new world now and we have to how is that actually practically what do we do you know do we have an app I mean seriously what yeah. do, what what are we how are we going to especially for young people and think I just think it's we were just starting to do all that and then COVID came along and sort of took over and I think we're in a little bit of a now we're coming back into the world and dealing with everyone again and we're not we're in a bit of a morass we haven't quite got it all sorted out so it's an interesting time but it's like that reaction to you uh I mean I didn't look at the things but when we talked on the phone the other day you mentioned something about it and I'd read something actually very interesting in the Guardian I told you that I'd, I'd read something in the Guardian and you said oh I hope it wasn't horrible like the tabloids I said it wasn't actually it actually address the thing about you being a, a woman in the media talking your truth and being that being a, an issue and hello right. isn't, that the, isn't that the whole point so it's I, I think it's a very interesting time I'm so excited to read your book oh thank you well I'm gonna send you a copy I'm gonna send you a copy I'm mine. excited and do you do you find writing obviously you like to write mm -hmm. um it's fun for you. Have you always sort of been drawn to the written word that way? And, um, or is this kind of something that happened later in life? Well, I used to write, um, you know, I, I started off, I did a stand up thing with a friend at college and we wrote all our own material and we wrote sort of loads of stuff. Actually, we, were, we went from being sort of like, you know, drunk students making things up at college into sort of national treasures in Scotland. And we had our own TV shows and everything. And we wrote all that. And then, I wrote more, more. I wrote more performative things. I wrote a sitcom in Britain and stuff like that. And then, and then you know, it's so in terms of 
the writing I do now, which is much more booky. That's I, I wrote a novel that came out in 2002. And I think I want to get back to that. Actually, I think the next thing I want, to, I actually really enjoyed finishing off this book during the pandemic. I'd been working on it for a few years, but getting the chance to actually really sit down and do it every day and think about it and work out what, you know. And not that, have that, too many distractions, right? Exactly, exactly. And not fit it into 15 other things in a day. So I, I, I really, I sort of think now I'd like to go try and, you know, if I do a book, if I write a next book, I think I'd like it to be a novel. And I think I'd like to try and really take the time off to do it and not just try and fit it into between films. Although next year's looking a bit busy. <laughs> Which Showbiz. is good. Yes, good. Yes, it's good. Yes, it's good. But it's also, I'm doing a thing that's completely nuts. I'm in it, which just takes me out for like four months next year. I'm going to do a solo dance piece in, uh, in, uh, it starts off at the Edinburgh Festival and then, you know, it's a tour and then comes to the Joyce Theatre in New York. And I'm, it, I mean, I love it because it's sort of the fact, my, my, my stage, you know, cabaret show I'm doing right now, one of them is called uh, Alan Cumming is not acting his age. And that's totally what I'm doing in this thing. But it's, and it's, I love the fact that I'm, I'll be 57 and I'll be, I've been doing a dance, but I'm not a dancer, but I'm just, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm able to, I'm allowed to, I'm working with great people. I'm going to give it my best shot. I think that thing of sometimes, you know, daring yourself to challenging yourself to do something that you might fail at is actually for me, a really important part of how I live. I, I every now and every few years, I see a pattern. I do something like that. Do I something think that scares you. Scares me like, up the wazoo like even like right you know physically i might not be able to do this i'm i'm nearly 60 and that i'm going to do a dance piece a solo dance piece it's not even other people around that i can sort of you know they can do a bit whilst i catch my breath uh we're gonna have video and things as well but anyway that i think is really exciting i'm really excited by that but it takes me away for many months and i it's sort of i'm i'm miss i'm missing the idea of being in my place in the Catskills and you know, it's going downstairs in my pajamas and writing. It would be great. Have you ever thought, you know, I, I've, I, as I've read more memoirs, I've thought about like Billy Crystal's uh, one man show that he did kind of tracing his, his life on Broadway. Was that, but the Sunday is something yeah. Sundays. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was yeah. great. And, and it seems to me, Alan, your life would really lend itself to something like that would that ever interest you well i mean i sort of feel that's what my cabaret shows are like the one like i i do these shows i mean i sing songs i tell stories and they've got they've got a theme like the last one was called legal immigrant it was about me being you know becoming a citizen of america this one's called alan cummings not acting his age that's about aging and stuff and the one before that was called alan cummings sings sappy songs <laughs> and I, I talked a bit about my dad and stuff and that. So I, I kind of think I do that. And I really like that. Oops. I really like that sort of connection you get with an audience when it's you, not a character. You know, you're. it's really you talking. And I sing as myself and I sing in my own Scottish accent as well. And I really enjoy that. But I I don't know. I You know, some <laughs> after <laughs> Not My Father's Son came out, people said, OK, we're, you know, my agents at the time were like, Okay, what about the film rights? I was like, what do you mean? Because we've got, I said, what? We're not going to sell the film rights of my traumatic childhood. I don't, I think writing the book's fine. <laughs> I do, I think, so, you know, choose your medium. Because that to me would be sort of, I mean, you've had such a rich, interesting life that has modeled, I think, how to deal with trauma. I don't know, just a thought. Just a thought. I'll Interesting. Call, yeah. Call me in a few years. I will. I will. When you're not so busy, when you're not yeah, doing your one man dance uh, show. Can you imagine? Hey, insane. but before we go, I'm just curious. And, and if you don't feel comfortable weighing in on this, I totally understand. But, you know, there's been so much conversation you were talking about earlier about young people and understanding identity and gender identity and sexual orientation in a much yeah. more sort of fulsome comprehensive way and a much more accepting way and there has been there's an interesting conversation going on obviously about dave Chappelle's comedy special on Netflix. oh yes yes and um it's been 
roundly criticized as very transphobic among other other descriptions and and uh you know i read a piece by roxanne gay about it i'm just curious netflix seems to be standing by you know his freedom of expression uh -huh. and um i i just i just wondered as somebody who's kind of watched this uh evolution of thought and been sort of at the center of it in many ways if you had any thoughts about that controversy i mean i feel right now the idea that people getting human getting basic rights and respect and dignity the idea that that would somehow take away from your rights is terrible and sort of says speaks to what uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't say very much and it's not a very nice uh, thing about your character if you think that and i find it, I, I just find it so disappointing that it all becomes about bathrooms and 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 you know the sports thing that actually it all becomes about we talk about people's bodies and not about their place in the world and their dignity and it just becomes about body parts and as soon as you do that I just think that makes that so degrading and undignified and disrespectful. But I also think I think a lot of his his um, approach is sort of pitting marginalized groups against each other. Mm. Um, that well, seems to me kind of one of the major these theses of or theses of his his show i'd be interested in you know it's not that long i'd be interested in if you have a I must second have to give it a look it. Yeah, i've been meaning i've been meaning to actually because i've heard so much about it and because they've mean, had think... a walk out you know a lot of netflix people are, are employees i don't know a lot but some are, are staging a walk out and oh, gosh um you know i think it raises a lot of questions about what else does he say comedy i mean i don't feel equipped to kind of really give you a, a fair synopsis of it um but but he talks about a friend he had uh who was trans who killed herself and um you know it's multi-layered and and roxanne gay wrote a really interesting piece on it so maybe what take a say? look what, well, what was her thing <laughs> Well, it's long and complicated. I don't <laughs> want to. I don't want to distill it into. No, I know. You know I mean, what I mean? think he's. I think he's really fascinating and brilliant, and I think he. Uh, but I don't know enough about this actually to speak about it either. But I also think I'm. I. I'm just. I've got. Uh, I'm very saddened, and you know. I I, I don't agree with with um. What J.K. Rowling did, and I think she. Um, I you know respect her opinion, but I think somehow bringing her own, um, you know, well, I don't know what I mean. I think when she brought the sexual assault thing into it, I find that very, very confusing and very upsetting. That and that, you know, when it comes down to it, do you want to respect another human being? Do you want to respect their rights? Do you want to give them dignity? I would think yes, yes, yes to all those questions. And I'm sure she would too. So if you can't see that your behavior or your words are preventing that or encouraging people to not do that, then you need to wise up, I think. It's also provided, I think, a platform for a conversation about this. Um, right. Which I think is, can be a positive thing um, if it if it doesn't divide hopelessly yeah. divide people but um you know it's an opportunity to to once again in this very cluttered uh media environment kind of get some of these yeah. issues to the forefront um, yeah but it's like it's like you know i mean i i hear you on that front and i do think that's uh, and it has been you know her uh, the jk rowling thing i read told her statements and yes it has made and it's also it's good for when for people to have like something well she said this so she and tariffs and everything, those things that people understand what they mean. And I think that's great to have reference points where you can discuss something. But also sometimes you, you know, it's like saying, oh, well, it's like when people, you know, like with Black Lives Matter, when people then say, oh, but White Lives Matter, that to me is not like, that's not a good basis for a discussion. Do you know what I mean? 
just someone saying something that's kind of offensive and not getting the point is not necessarily a good point for us to start as our as our touchstone. That's I, my I, own, I, that's my worry. Yeah, I think I think it it stems from people not being educated and and kind of getting you know getting their point of view sort of channeled to them yeah in some... in ways that aren't necessarily helpful and holistic but no and they're sort of knee jerky i mean that's the thing about you know that's what i think is interesting about the education system in america all this all the thing all the sort of social services the health system even the justice system if you have money you're going to be okay i used to think you needed money to obviously you need money to be healthy in this country you need money to be educated in this country but i think you also need money to have justice in this country and um you you know it's in it's in the interests of the system that for people to remain un, uh, ill-educated because they can it's easier to feed them misinformation and it's easier to keep to make them vote for you and i think that's what is a terrible indictment of of the way that people view uh, have allowed education and health to, to come in America, basically it's saying, you're only going to get a decent education and, and you're going to only be guaranteed to be, uh, you know, I know so many people who can't afford to go to the doctor and they're not poor. They just don't have insurance. And they were in a, and it's America's one of the, you know, the richest countries in the world. And yet people can't actually have things that most, most other countries take for granted from their government. And I, I find that's, you know, we're seeing now the results of that in terms of the way misinformation is is and the fact that you know many people in this country don't even believe that the current president won the election you know stuff like that is a result of people not having access to education for many many years so it's just i don't know i, I find i've loved living here and i love the life i have but more and more i kind of think i you know, my my being back in Scotland is certainly you know before the election last year, Scotland was looking like we were we were, I was, we were going to be out. I was getting death threats and things like that, and for posting stuff on my Instagram account, and you know it, it was a terrifying time to be. And you shouldn't have to live with that. You know, you shouldn't have to worry about the sort of the mob mentality. And I I uh, I don't know my my sort of fantasy for my sort of Greta Garbo, Scottish entertainment legend <laughs> <laughs> lifestyle is to be in a, in a state in Scotland away from everybody. And uh, I'm feeling that I'm surrounded by, you know, people, I, I think that's the thing. I, I, I realise that I come from a country that has a safety net, thinks it's important for the government to provide a safety net for people and a country that looks after other people. And it's not every man for himself. It's, you know, Let's try and look after each other, and of course, there's poverty, and there's all, the, and there's there's those things. But at its core, it's a bit more caring, and actually, education is much is very important, and the health service is there for everyone's access, and that, I feel, the longer I stay in America, then the iniquities I see in in those areas it are harder and harder to deal with. Scotland looking pretty good these days. <laughs> yes, go Scotland for the win. <laughs> Before we go, you're, you're going to be traveling all over the place talking about this book. And boy, you are going to be so sick of talking about yourself, Alan. <laughs> I know. Well, you too. You know what it's Me like. Me too. Yeah. I do. I, I do. You and you started, I, I sometimes start forget. Making up what? Stories. I, well, you I start, do. No, I don't. I don't. But I'm tempted to because I'm so bored with myself. <laughs> I want to be able to like, isn't there something new I can I, talk about? You know, I've done that in junkets when because you get you ask the questions about the film or whatever. And I, I, you know, like you do 60 interviews a day or something. And then the, uh, on interview like 43, I'll suddenly say a completely different because it's all the same questions. I'll say something completely different. And the crew are just so bored and they're starting. And then suddenly they kind of come out of this reverie and go, wait, what? What did he say? What? I love that. I love trying to kind of fox them. But I might the thing I find is that I'm worried that I've said the same thing twice that's that's my way because you do you're doing interview after interview after interview and you think oh god if i just i know myself. and you're like wait did i already just did i talk about that oh no yes, that was yes. two interviews ago i know well, it's terrible. i i love talking to you and i i could just talk to you all day because um it's lovely to talk first to of you, all, i love your accent and i just i love <laughs> what 
I love what you're saying. And um, even though and, we're jicking out together on October the 26th. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but your Good. new book is called Baggage. I think people are going to love it and they already love you. Well, most people. You, can't <laughs> right, yeah. you listen, Alan, you can't ba bat a thousand. I mean, we live in this crazy world. And totally. I, think I don't like everybody. I don't expect everyone to like me. I, I love that. I respect me, though. Yeah, I saw that on Instagram. Why should everyone like you when you don't like everyone? Yeah, fair enough. You know, but yeah. on the other hand, like, like, let's not shit on people. Right. You may not yeah. like people, but you don't have to be so aggressive. About it's like it, right? RPG is like, you know, I'm not asking for just whatever, but just take your boot off my neck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Thank you, Alan. So lovely. Good luck with Great your book, to too. See you. Thank you. Good luck with yours, but not as much luck as mine. <laughs> Bless you for that magnanimous finish. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>